Hello, I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to this programme on stroke. And we're coming to you on the Rural Health Channel. I'd like to acknowledge that this programme has been broadcast from the land of the Wangal people of the Darug tribe, traditional custodians of the land and part of the Aboriginal nation known as Eora. And we acknowledge their elders past and present. Now, stroke, most commonly from what's called ischemia, that's where you've got a blockage of the artery, is Australia's second biggest killer after coronary heart disease. The real tragedy, though, is that strokes are preventable. And if you have one, they're much more treatable than ever before if you reach the right care soon enough. And all that is what tonight's programme is about. Now, you don't have to be a doctor, a nurse, a pharmacist, or a clinical person of any kind to watch this programme or get something out of it. Uh, we welcome questions from everybody watching on NITV here. So get in touch and ask your questions. And there are several ways you, <coughs> that you can do that. You can email us on questions at rhef.com.au. You can text us on 0408 408 932. Or you can phone us on 1800 817 268, and we'll put you on air, in fact. Or you can tweet us uh, through at Rural Health Ed, and we'll continue putting up those contact details for you up, uh, up on the screen, and we'll take your calls uh, whenever, or your comments whenever, in fact, you'd like to uh, do so. Let's meet our panel, though, who are experts who can answer all the questions, I'm sure, that you're going to have. Anne Butler is a rural and remote area nurse practitioner from Mergen in Queensland. Welcome, Anne. Thank you. Chris Levi is talking to us on Skype from his office at the University of Newcastle in New South Wales. He's Professor of Neurology, an NHMRC practitioner fellow, and leads the University of Newcastle's and Hunt, University of Newcastle and Hunter Medical Research Institute's Centre for Translational Neuroscience and Mental Health Research, and also runs the Stroke Service in the Hunter region. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Norman. Pleasure to be here. Geraldine Doyle is a pharmacist from Bungendore in New South Wales. Welcome, Geraldine. Thank you, Norman. Linda Nichols is a registered nurse and lecturer at the University of Tasmania. Welcome, Linda. Thank you, Noel. And Peter Joyner is a general practitioner in Manham in South Australia and director of medical services at Berry Riverland Hospital. Welcome to you all. Thank you, Noel. Thank you. Thanks, Noel. I mean, how you, I presume that you're on at, at Berry Hospital? Yes, yes, I help, yes. So how often do you actually see people with stroke? It's a fairly busy place at Berry, and I think we would probably have someone come with a stroke certainly several times through each month. Um, and we are now trying to change the ability to be active and to intervene. Uh, we'll address this later in this, this mm. program, I'm sure, but we're trying to identify those patients who can be helped by correct medical involvement early in their stroke time, which really means under four or five hours from the time the stroke started. Luckily at Berry, there's a CT scanner that's dedicated at staff and a facility to have a backup by neurologists from Adelaide so that through most of the, certainly through the weekdays, we can assess a patient and decide if we can intervene there appropriately with thrombolytic therapy. That's a drug designed to dissolve a clot which may be causing the blockage in the brain. And, and that's a new advance. And we'll come back to that later. But really, a lot of what tonight's program is about is prevention and how to avoid a stroke in the first place or if you've had indications of a stroke how to prevent a real one happening in the future. Linda what's your involvement in the whole stroke area? From a primary health care perspective it's about getting out there and getting that primary prevention getting patients and individuals taking the medications that have been prescribed and getting the secondary prevention out there. So when you say primary agent. prevention, this is preventing it in the first place. Yep. Secondary prevention, you've had a stroke and you don't want to have a second one. Don't want a second one, yep. What myths do you find out there about stroke and its prevention? It's the symptoms will recover on their own. It's probably the big one. They'll well, go away. If I just away. sit here, we, it'll all go away. We wait a while, they'll go away. Or that warning sign I had two weeks ago, I just, I'll just ignore that. Yep. Geraldine, your involvement in this area? As a pharmacist? Well, as a pharmacist, um, I know the risk factors for stroke, um, biggest one being hypertension. High and blood pressure. Uh, uh, I try to uh, make sure that the patients are compliant with their medication. I can notice from their records whether they've picked up their prescriptions every month. So compliance with medication is, is where I'm coming from and also um, encouraging people to know their numbers to know their, uh, blood, their blood pressure, their weight, 
um, and watch their diet. Know where they're at. So Anne, it could be pretty scary as a remote nurse sometimes. Yeah, it can be. Um, we look at, I, I work in mainly prevention as well and a lot of education, keeping people well educated about their health. So do you find people are a bit too blasé? Yeah, especially in the remote sector, yeah. I think it'll be all right, don't need to take the pills this month. No. Chris, um, although we're talking a lot about uh, how bad stroke is, there's a good news story in Australia. I mean, it has, the deaths from stroke have gone down a lot. They have, Norman, and, and that is um, excellent news. But we can't really be complacent here because we haven't seen a major reduction in the actual attack rates or event rates or incidents over the last 20 years. There's been a trend downwards, which is good. However, with our ageing population, the absolute numbers of people suffering stroke in the community have risen. So um, recent estimates are there's around 375,000 stroke sufferers um, present currently in, in Australia. And uh, a significant proportion of those people, unfortunately, are disabled, probably around a third to a half of them. Um, so um, our ageing population creates numerous challenges, one of them being um, that we have to keep working on reducing stroke incidents and attack rates in order to try and um, reduce that actual burden of stroke in our community. Now for those people watching Chris who are not uh, medical, we should just go through what stroke is. I mean there are two causes, one is a blocked blood vessel and one is a haemorrhage. Correct and the blocked blood vessel um, generally caused by a blood clot that forms um, and travels uh, often to the brain and lodges in a vessel. That accounts for around 85% of all stroke. And as you said in the introduction, these are the ischemic strokes uh, where the brain starved of oxygen and glucose. And within a fairly short time frame, although um, the time frame um, around which you can salvage that brain tissue is around the four to five hour mark, as, as we heard, um, that stroke um, is the dominant form. About 10 to 15% of strokes are due to a rupture or leaking blood vessel, so-called cerebral hemorrhage. And um, unfortunately at the moment we don't have um, as effective treatments for hemorrhage, although recently an important study has just been uh, published demonstrating that lowering blood pressure in the acute phase of that hemorrhage can actually afford some benefit. So we have treatments, both to unblock the arteries, that is the thrombolytic, therapy um, that Peter referred to and more recently the, uh, the evidence emerging that lowering the blood pressure if it is a hemorrhage can actually reduce the head of pressure and reduce the expansion of, of that hemorrhage and improve outcomes for patients. Don't forget uh, if you've got a question or a comment to make you can ring us and you can ring us on 1800 817 268 or you can email us at questions at rhef.com.au so keep those questions coming in. Peter, what are the risk factors? I mean, what, what puts you at risk of a stroke? I think everyone should be aware of this, as you'll see as we progress to tonight, the prevention and identification of those risk factors is a key aspect of uh, healthy lifestyle. So first, a general healthy lifestyle, specifically not smoking, having a weight which is reasonable, exercising regularly, having blood pressure and cholesterol levels controlled, and if you're a diabetic, having good control of your diabetes would be the essential points. So smoking is pretty toxic to your, your brain? It is. Tox smoke damages most blood vessels throughout the body, literally from head to toe. So your toes may drop off from gangrene, you may get a stroke, or you may have a heart attack. All three are greater in people who smoke, but luckily Australia's now heading downhill with the smoking rates, and with the work that's gone on for many years, we're seeing less smokers now. So hopefully that'll be less of a problem in the future. And blood pressure is toxic too. Blood pressure is toxic when we think about the blood vessels. So it has much more effect on the brain than it does on the heart. It does, yes. The heart can compensate and in fact the heart as a muscle tends to respond by getting bigger, which is of limited value after a while. But if we look at the, at the brain, the blood vessels are reasonably small, reasonably fragile. And if you blow up the pressure inside, they are at risk of rupturing, which is hemorrhage, which is difficult to control. And in addition, if you have cholesterol levels as well, 
you can have what we call fatty plaques or lumps of uh, clot and cholesterol which will also block the system. Diabetes? Diabetes is an illness unfortunately which affects almost every part of our body uh, and typically it also affects blood vessel um, health if you want to use that broad spectrum. It People with diabetes have a greater incidence of heart attacks, strokes, kidney disease and peripheral vascular disease where the arteries and blood vessels to the legs are affected giving you unfortunately gangrene at some times if it gets out of control. So with diabetes it should be that the person who has that understands that their control of their diabetes is helping them. It's not to make the doctor feel happy, it's to make the patient have as good a life as possible and avoid these rather nasty complications. Christopher, what about this underdiagnosed and misdiagnosed condition called atrial fibrillation where the top two chambers of your heart kind of quiver and don't beat properly? Look, it's a real silent um, epidemic, unfortunately. Um, again, with our ageing population, it's becoming more common. In fact, around one in 10 people over the age of 75 to 80 will have it and only a third of those people will actually be aware. And how are you aware, if you, if you are aware, if you are one of those 30% who are aware, what do you notice? Okay, so the symptoms can be quite subtle, but um, um, you can notice palpitation or a feeling of an irregular um, rhythm of the heart that you feel as a jumping or a thumping in the chest. You can feel tired, uh, non-specific symptoms like that, moving on to breathlessness, uh, difficulty, um, uh, with the exercise tolerance um, and occasionally um, pain um, in the chest. So Peter, why are you at risk of a stroke with atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation, the heart is essentially in upper and lower chambers. The upper chambers are called the atria. They normally, in what we call regular rhythm or sinus rhythm, they pump and they clear the blood with each pumping action and there is no residual blood that is dormant, if you want, in that area. In atrial fibrillation, the top part of the heart quivers, as you said, it doesn't pump, and the lining has lots of grooves in it, and it's just like um, any other situation, it'll have sludge, if you want to use that word, will build up, and when they come into what we call emboli, fragments break off and are pushed by the heart out of the heart, and the first blood vessel it meets is the two that go up to the brain, thus carrying these clots to the brain, they go through the vessels until they come to a narrow vessel that they can't get through and they block and any point beyond that runs out of oxygen and dies. And Chris, the risk is quite considerable in some people. Yes, look, the risk can be as high as 15 to 20 per cent per year of an embolus firing off from the heart and lodging in the brain. 20 per cent per year, um, meaning after five per years... Year, you so after five years, it's game over. 100% of people will have had a major event. And often these strokes are quite severe because these clots, as Peter was saying, can be quite sizable and can block quite large vessels to the brain and put large areas of brain at risk. Linda, how wide do you think the people are aware of atrial fibrillation? They know about blood pressure, they know about cholesterol, they might know about diabetes as a risk factor for stroke. Have people heard of atrial fibrillation out there in the community? It's not well known, it's not well spoken about, and it's, it's not on the general, will we assess patients for that when they come in for medical care? People will ask for their blood pressure to be taken. We don't talk about it enough. It should be out there more um, in the public. More people should be tested, and testing patients when they do come in with other chronic illnesses, with other, um, if they come in with a transient ischemic attack, getting them actually getting that ECG done and testing them for atrial fibrillation is really important. Because it's an ECG that makes the diagnosis. Sometimes yep. you can feel it on the pulse, but that's why it's misdiagnosed. We need to get it diagnosed. Yes, perhaps I could interrupt, Norman, that with diabetes, every diabetic person should have an ECG once a year. Mm -hmm because often with diabetes they have other heart problems. But also I try to make it a practice that in my area that if you're examining a patient for their driving licence, which is quite common in South Australia when they're over 70, it only takes 10 or 20 seconds to check the pulse. And if it's irregular, you can have a check ECG done and you can pick up people who are completely asymptomatic at, that, at least that regular visit to their doctor, which is important. Uh, Chris, is there any evidence um, that living in rural areas, obviously 
um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are at increased risk, a very, a very considerably increased risk of stroke along with their heart risk. But just rurality by itself, does that make a difference living in rural Australia? There is some evidence that um, hospitalisations for stroke are higher in rural and remote communities. Um, and that's um, um, fairly recently been highlighted by an Institute of Health and Welfare report that was only released um, early this week. There's also a trend towards higher uh, stroke mortality in rural populations and as you said Norman the one thing that's astounding is if you look at the statistics for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, strokes are occurring very much younger um, and if you have a stroke between age 35 and 55 and you are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander your chance of dying from that stroke is actually five times higher than uh, a non-Indigenous person of that age it's astonishing um, and um, and uh, a real problem. And what about gender? There's this story that if your mother had a stroke, you're at risk of a stroke. What's going on with genetics and inheritance with strokes? The genetics is a hot topic for research and it, it's really not well understood as yet. Family history is still our best, um, I guess, surrogate for what um, genetic variants you might be carrying. And it's likely there'll be hundreds of minor variations in your genome that are associated with risk of vascular disease like stroke um, but it is true that there's this interesting relationship between female um, gender and transmission of a higher risk and uh, we don't un understand this because we don't understand yet what all the variants are but family history does um, have a significant um, in increased uh, risk if you carry a, f a family history so it's ba basically telling you that you need to do more about your modifiable risk factors, the ones we've talked about, blood pressure, smoking, uh, cholesterol, diabetes. So Geraldine, for all these reasons that we've been talking about, people are starting to talk about brain attacks rather than strokes, you know, to, to give the same sense of urgency as heart attacks. And there's a mnemonic here, FAST, um, that we, everybody should know about. Tell us what FAST means. Uh, FAST is the symptoms of a stroke. You look at the face, and if they can't, you try to get them to raise their arms. So you're looking, what are you looking for in the face? You're looking for a s slurred, uh, uh, one side of the mouth dropped, a slurred speech. Can't smile as evenly as you can't used to. Can't smile. They can't raise their arms. And then, you, then you're looking at their speech. Or their arm droops once their, you... And then a speech and T is for time. And speech is, if your speech slurred. is slurred. Yes. And or I could say, Norman, I could chip in and say also if, you, if they don't seem to understand what you're saying because the speech disturbance can be both slurring or difficulty getting words out, um, but also difficulty un understanding is, is, is sometimes seen um, as part of that uh, speech disturbance. Uh, we've got a question from Adrian in Mount Isa in Queensland. How important is blood sugar control if you've got diabetes in reducing the risk of stroke? We all know that blood pressure control makes a huge difference. What about actually blood sugar control? Chris? Yeah, this has been one of the curiosities really that um, blood sugar control hasn't had good blood sugar control, hasn't been shown to have a major influence on vascular um, outcomes in diseases like stroke and heart attack. It does improve significantly the small vessel problems that can occur in the kidneys and the eye from diabetes. So important, it's really important to maintain good blood glucose control, but it's not the most important thing for the large vessels in the heart or the brain. And it looks as if um, blood pressure, cholesterol are really even more important in diabetic people um, than those without diabetes. So absolutely aggressive and rigorous control of blood pressure and cholesterol and of course not, not smoking um, are the key things to prevent stroke in um, people with diabetes. Um, Brian from Dubbo asks, I'm, says I'm 65 and I've been told I should be taking tablets for my blood pressure. I don't want to take them. Is there anything else I can do? Peter? I think what, he, what Brian needs to do is to discuss with his GP his concerns. There's absolutely nothing wrong with trying to help your blood pressure by maintaining good weight, good exercise 
and, and following a sensible diet, and if your blood pressure returns to um, a reasonable range, that could well be all that is necessary. So let's be, let's be specific about the non-drug intervention. So if you lose about 10% of your body weight, that's about the same as a blood pressure tablet for some people. For some people, yes. And it's controversial, but it looks as though th if you follow the exercise guidelines, there. so this is not an easy thing. It's easier taking a tablet than doing what you've got to do to yeah, reduce your blood pressure. Exercise is the cheapest and most useful treatment for many diseases, including, for instance, diabetes. But, but it's, it's got to be the followed. most days of the week, moderate exercise. It's not, it's not just going out for a casual no, walk. No, it's 20 again. minutes to 30 minutes of moderate exercise each day. It's not just one day when you go and do a long run and leave it at that. And, Chris, the evidence on salt restriction? while we're talking about non-drug interventions yeah. for Brian? Yeah, look, salt, salt restriction has a modest effect. Um, um, and, um, uh, you know, I think in individual cases it is worth, um, worth doing. The difficulty is it's, it's, um, there's salt ubiquitous in, in many, many of our foods hidden away. So it's tough to actually achieve the, often the level of restriction that has a significant impact on blood pressure. So we do counsel people, yes, don't add salt, uh, watch what you eat, but it's it's tough. And I think it's um, it's important, but probably more important at a whole population regulatory level rather than the individual patient level. But, I mean, Linda here, if no added, what do you say to people? No added salt, don't, you know, and you know, watch yourself, low, low salt products. And I assume, you know, and the other thing is, if you're eating a calorie control diet, you're also eating less salt because you're eating less food. I mean, that involves less processed foods, but it's very difficult to maintain that as one individual within a family or within a community. I mean, these changes are better off when they come as a whole family unit or as a community unit. And do you often get asked about the same sort of question, how, yeah. do, I, how do I get off my blood pressure tablets? Yes, a lot of people come in and they don't want to take them and don't want to take blood pressure tablets, so we would advise them with the healthy diet and the exercise, but monitoring their blood pressure. Because if it doesn't work, you really don't you want to blow to your know. head off. Mm. You, That's you, so they need to take a diary and keep a record. And of course, home monitoring of blood pressure is mm. actually more accurate than having it done at the doctor's surgery, with That's all due right. respect. I, you're Peter. perfectly <laughs> right. And in fact, many of us use 24 hour monitoring because it gives you a good, yeah. honest, mm. and reliable input. And it helps to make patients aware as well of what actually happens and that they don't feel any different when their blood pressure is high as compared to normal, which is uh, quite an interesting situation for many patients to realise. So Brian, you've got lots of answers there to your question, but it's a bit of hard work. You're going to have to put in a bit of effort there if you want to control your blood pressure and make sure you do control your blood pressure because you don't want to land up in double base hospital with a stroke. Now we've had a text and they didn't put their, the person didn't put his or her name on the text. Um, so our textless, our nameless text persons asks, how do we differentiate between which sort of stroke when you're living in a remote area and have limited medical access? Well, why don't we hold off on the answer to that? Because in fact, our case study should help to answer that question because it's deliberately designed to test out what the different kinds of stroke are and how you actually might uh, make up your, your mind. Let's, so let's go to our case study. Sandra is, uh, oh sorry, and before I do, just uh, if we just come back to, uh, um, please keep those questions coming in. 1-800-817-268. Do phone in, we'll put you on air. Um, questions at rhef.com.au or text us, and I don't have the number in front of me, but it will come up on the screen shortly due to the wonders of uh, modern te of television technology. Let's go to our case study. Sandra is a 70-year-old retiree living in rural Australia. She's obese, she's got high blood pressure, she's got raised fats, blood fats like cholesterol, hyperlipidemia they call it. She has a history of migraine and her blood pressure has gone untreated. She, she saw her general practitioner about 18 months ago and was given drugs called perindopril and endapamide there to treat, common drugs used to treat with blood pressure, but in fact she, has, she hasn't stuck with it. And she comes in uh, to see you, Peter, and she's been having tingling in her right arm and in her tongue, and she thinks she might have a bad migraine, but she's not sure. In fact, she's come to the emergency department at the hospital. So when you examine her, she's got a steady pulse, and, or it seems to be a steady pulse, and her blood pressure is 150 on 105, meaning it's, uh, it's quite raised. 
OK, the concern we have is trying to work out, is this a migraine attack? And many people will have some of those symptoms with migraine, or what we call TIA, which stands for a transient or passing episode like a stroke. Uh, a stroke is where there is permanent damage to the brain from lack of oxygen and glucose. A TIA is where it's a transient. It comes and it goes, usually within the space of half an hour to an hour, but can occasionally extend up to 24 hours. So in this situation with Sandra, you need to look at her total examination, particularly focusing on is there any discernible neurological damage or deficit? Now this is, I mean, it is difficult because she's a woman, she's got migraine, yep. and women with migraine are at more risk, particularly if they've had migraine, what's with aura, where they get a premonition that they're going to get the, yes. a migraine attack, they are at increased risk of stroke. There is that relationship, yes, but obviously the converse isn't true, that every person who has a migraine will get a stroke and we need to separate it. You may well decide to treat the migraine with normal migraine treatment, which can often include either medication or fluid. Uh, given intravenously, many people are dehydrated and that adds to their migraine. But if there was any objective neurological signs of damage or poor function, as in we've heard of some of those speech arm or leg uh, weakness, difficulty in talking, difficulty with cognition, some new change, you would very strongly th be worried about a TIA or a stroke developing and you would treat it in that perspective. If there were no neurological signs, you would probably be more comforted that this is likely to be migraine, but you could well take this opportunity to point out to this Sandra the risk she's taking by not looking after her own health, in this case by keeping a very sensible eye on the blood pressure. But if they phoned you up in, in remote Australia, um, and not so easy, because you can't examine them. Yeah, no, you'd, you'd have to try and get a good history on the phone if they're ringing you up, um, and try and get the person to give you as much information as possible. So Chris, this is a hard one. I mean, you don't really know whether this is a transient ischemia attack, a stroke evolving, um, or just another migraine attack, even though she tells you she hasn't had symptoms like that before. It is. It's very difficult. And this is, as Peter said, this is where you need, um, as clinician, as a clinician, to use your clinical skills. And, it, and it's, it's, it's not easy. The diagnosis of stroke and transient stroke, transient ischemic attack, uh, is often quite difficult. Um, in, th in this particular case, it, it's, it's, it's um, going to depend, as Peter said, on whether there are any definite clinical signs. Um, so which, just, just to course, explain again to our non-medical audience here, so when you say clinic, it's clinical, it's a difference between symptoms and signs. You've got a symptom, I've got tingling in my arm, I've got tingling yes. or numbness in my tongue. A sign is you hold out your arms, one starts to drift, or I can't smile, yes. or um, I might be right. a bit blind in one eye. Yes, yeah, so in this particular case, you'd be looking to see whether the sensory symptoms actually were associated with any objective evidence of sensory loss. So is the person actually unable to feel um, light touch or pinprick? Um, and then you'd look for those what we call motor signs. So is there weakness of face, weakness of arm, weakness of leg? Is there difficulty with speech pronunciation or production? But you can um, still get that in migraine. You can, you can in, indeed. And the, the default position and, the, and the, the position that we take as clinicians is, is um, be very careful don't take risks and of course stroke is a serious problem and if there if you were suspicious if there were signs or even if there weren't signs but you were suspicious you would manage this as a possible stroke and you'd take it down that that pathway um, the deficit as described in the case study is fairly mild at this point in time um, but you would um, most probably take the course of admitting this person watching very carefully over the next half an hour to an hour as to what happened and um, and then uh, come to a clearer judgment clinically plus get imaging if if you can get in imaging and that can be difficult I appreciate in 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 the more uh, rural and remote setting but that's a very important part of your diagnosis because it's a clinico radiological diagnosis stroke it so you're looking on, on the CAT scan of the head you're looking for whether or not there's hemorrhage because you can't see if there's a clot there you are looking primarily to see whether there's hemorrhage or also any mimic, anything else that might uh, mimic a stroke. Um, such r rarely you see small tumours, um, you see other odd 
uh, abnormalities on scan that can mimic this. So you would look for those. There are scanning techniques that can identify the ischemia. Uh, generally, they're more sophisticated, um, but are becoming more readily available across all of our hospitals now. And um, at what point here are you going to decide that this is a transient ischemic attack? So in other words, a premonition, if you like, of a stroke rather than a real stroke versus migraine. I mean, what are you going to do here? How you okay, I think if you, as we've just both discussed, if there are signs of a neurological deficit or a problem, a sign, you may then feel that it, and depending upon where you are in relationship to your ability to A, have a CT and B, any intervention. If you were in very remote area where there was no possibility of having a CT scan within several hours, you may decide a safe, safe precaution would be to provide aspirin, ask the person to take an aspirin, um, to see if that would help to improve the situation, which in some cases with TIA or even early strokes will help to modify that. If the person is close enough to a support area where you can either have a CT or you can have even thrombolysis, that's dissolving of a clot, and that usually means living within a couple of hours travel time to those places, you may well decide to discuss that on the phone with a stroke physician and discuss with that person the way to streamline their assessment in that system so that if it did continue to develop and a stroke was evident, that you've put, under, you've put the person on the pathway to achieve the best possible treatment, which is dissolving the clot in an area that's used to dealing with clots that way in order to get the best result. But that geographically is somewhat limited in many, many parts of rural Australia. So, I mean, the problem here, Linda, is that um, if it's a TIA, um, in a sense, the woman's lucky because this is a, a glorious opportunity for her to prevent a real stroke because the real, there's a real risk of having a, a, a proper stroke. A secondary stroke following it. And we know that this is, our op this is our time that we've got this opportunity now to assess these patients. So we do promote hospitalisation as the best practice for patients with um, TIAs so that they can be fully assessed, get their blood pressure controlled, um, get their cholesterol managed, and have all those interventions done to reduce the risk of a secondary stroke. And an electrocardiogram, presumably, yeah. mm. to check for atrial fibrillation. The, um, how, let's say um, she has, when you do an electrocardiograph, she has atrial fibrillation. In other words, a, an irregular pulse and it looks like atrial fibrillation. How do you know, Peter, whether or not she deserves to have anticoagulation, her blood thinned, to prevent this clotting in the atrium? Um, not everyone who has atrial fibrillation is at risk of having an emboli. It basically relates the embolus to... is the emboli clot that breaks, breaks off. Part, uh, a clot breaks off and goes down the tube, which is uh, one of the arteries, to block that. Um, it's relating to age and other underlying diseases, and there's this CHAD score, which basically describes if the person already has evidence of congestive cardiac failure, has high blood pressure, has an age of more than 75, and has diabetes, and in particular has a previous history of a stroke or TIA, and your question a moment ago about this being a warning, we know that where people have a TIA, and they're in these group of patients I've described there, they have a very high risk of progressing to a full stroke in a relatively short time, even as short as a few weeks. So this is really a, a warning sign. This is and the people that um, Chris was describing who have a, almost 100% risk in five years of having yes. a stroke. And so if I have a patient sitting with me, and this has happened lots in general practice, you do this and you say, look, if your score, as we've discussed, is high, you are in the spectrum of uh, people who will have a very high instance of a stroke every year. You've got, shall we say, an 8 to 10 percent risk is probably a minimum, in which case you could then provide the person with advice and education about warfarin, anticoagulation of the blood to make it thinner, as we call it, or stop a clotting. If the person was at very low risk, under 60, no other problems, you may decide either nothing or aspirin. And if the person's in between, Again, you discuss it with a patient, it's always the patient's decision, but based on your advice and input, and you would use warfarin or aspirin uh, in so, that situation. So Sandra's at moderate risk, because she, if, if this is a TR, a if you decide this is a transient ischemic yep. attack rather than migraine, she's at moderate risk. Yes. Because that's a pretty high score. Yes. Just from well, in fact, in her case, oh. she's got 
Uh, I don't know if she had congestive cardiac failure or diabetes, but she certainly was, I think, she she's 70 years old. 70. So, yeah. So she's a moderate risk. She's on the board. Yeah. Um, talk to me, Geraldine, about some of the issues in relation to these medications. So you're on low-dose aspirin. You're on warfarin, which is a blood thinner, which uh, stops your blood clotting. And you've got to monitor a test on a regular basis to make sure you're on the right dose because you don't want to be too high and you don't want to be too low. Then you've got to go on blood pressure medications and sometimes diabetes. Give us the range of medications that people are on and some of the issues that they confront. Well, the, the warfarin problem is that they have to have uh, their INR tested. So that's, called, that's their international normalised ratio. So this is yeah. a number that you've got this to get, like 2.5. They have to be between 2 and 3. And they have to physically go to the uh, doctor's surgery to have their blood tested. And for the, a lot of people that, who have mobility problems, this is a problem. But they can test themselves at home these days. Uh, some people can. Some people aren't capable. Some people uh, have difficulty w with their diet, um, just their, their way of living, at, at maintaining a, a low INR. Um, people have trouble remembering to take their medications. Uh, I think everybody should have um, more re recording of their medications, self-recording so that if they do end up in a hospital situation... We can also have these dosage administration needs. Yes, they can have their um, medications packed. But they've still got to remember to push that little packet of tablets out every morning, and a lot of them don't. Um, some, uh, some people, the cost of medications bothers them, and they try to cut out a few. Um, but the... Yes, there are... The, Continuous INR testing, some people just can't manage. But it's not as bad as many people make out. I mean, if you've been on warfarin for a while, once you're s stable on it, you don't need to have it done that often. No, but they, uh, they still have to keep taking the warfarin all the time, and they have to keep a, you know, a, a diet that's regu regular. They have to watch what they eat and watch yeah, what they perhaps drink. Perhaps I could just briefly interrupt because the diet problem is that if you have green vegetables, for instance, it counteracts by having a high vitamin K, it counteracts warfarin. So if someone has a splurge on broccoli one week, their INR is likely to get too low. If they adjust it to that and the next week they go off that diet, you're going to be too high. Yeah. So it's education and it is difficult. Yeah. Some it's patients okay if they eat broccoli yeah. every night or yeah. spinach every night. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, Chris, are there some blood pressure tablets that are more effective than others at reducing the risk of stroke? Blood, blood pressure tablets um, have been trialled for prevention. All, all types of blood pressure tablets have been trialled for prevention of first stroke, and, and it, there isn't really very much difference between them as long as they work. So you can take a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker or uh, these other varieties of newer neuro agents called ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor an antagonists. As long as they bring the blood pressure down a few notches, they, they will work. Um, the information that we have, the research around blood pressure lowering after stroke and TIA is a little um, more restricted. The evidence is predominantly around, uh, in fact, the drugs that uh, Sandra was on, um, the um, ACE inhibitor perindopril and the diuretic indapamide. Um, so um, uh, that's where most of the evidence is. So in fact, she was on quite reasonable treatment. Uh, most probably given her blood pressure, she was may not have been taking it or, um, or may be one of these people that is refractory to treatment and needs um, additional medication plus lifestyle intervention. And let's talk about this, um, your blood thinning, if your CHAD score is moderate or high and you need to be on, so everybody after they've had a TIA or a stroke needs to be on aspirin and we're talking about 100 milligrams a day, 75 or 100 milligrams a day, is that right? Correct, yeah, look, you can get away with very low doses of aspirin, um, uh, proven to be effective, even as low as 50 milligrams a day, um, but the tablets tend to be 100 milligram strength. Um, and that tends to be well, well tolerated. The higher doses tend to cause a little bit of GI upset sometimes in some people, but the 100 milligrams is, is very well tolerated. And just take us through this warfarin issue because 
Very mm. expensive drugs have come on the market recently um, mm. and controversially to replace mm. warfarin in, in people with atrial fibrillation. Um, and, but there, whilst it sounds attractive that there's no testing attached to them, one of the problems is there's no testing attached to them is that you've no idea really whether they're working and whether you're, whether they're on an adequate dose and if you need surgery, um, they're not easily reversed. Yeah, look, I think there's, there's upsides and downsides to all things um, when it comes to pharma, pharma, pharmaceuticals and pharmacology. Um, I think on, on, the, on, the, on the positive side, we, we do know that there are significant proportions of patients who can't take warfarin for one or other reasons, um, such, such as either innate genetic variation that makes their INRs difficult to control, dietary issues um, and drug interactions. So there are, there are a proportion of patients who can't take warfarin. In fact, when the Stroke Foundation did its most recent audit of people coming into hospital with stroke and atrial fibrillation, only a third of them were on warfarin. So there's a big gap in terms of um, and making sure that people are adi adequately protected. Uh, but these new agents um, um, are not um, a, a complete replacement for warfarin. They are a, an adjuvant. They will be able to be used in people who are unable to take warfarin for various reasons. And they have some potential advantages uh, in terms of the, the, um, the lack of any need for blood testing, so a set and forget um, single dosage approach and also they do have a significantly lower risk of brain hemorrhage and that's one of the most feared complications of warfarin bleeding um, into the gut or in the, from the skin or from other places can be managed but if you bleed into your brain it's a major problem so um, brain hemorrhage is something that uh, we all fear and these agents do seem to have an advantage there so there will be a niche for these drugs and they'll, they're actually, um, um, as I understand it, very soon to be available on the PBS. So um, there, there will be um, programs around to educate people in using these uh, and where they fit in the landscape of uh, atrial fibrillation and uh, anticoagulation. Well, we've just got to be careful we don't bankrupt the country. <laughs> yes, and I think there will be fairly significant restrictions on, on um, who can have access to these drugs. Um, I would imagine that's, uh, that's uh, almost a given. And, and why doesn't, um, uh, and I apologise to the audience who are non-medical here that I'm asking these technical questions, but why, do, there's a drug called clopidogrel which is used in people to prevent clotting when they've had a stent put into their heart. Why wouldn't mm. you just, uh, why, uh, which is a little bit cheaper than some of these newer drugs that are coming on the market, why wouldn't you just use something like clopidogrel to prevent, to prevent stroke in these people at higher risk? In the atrial fibrillation patients, it has been trialled and unfortunately it, it really is, is ineffective. Um, it's curious that the anti-platelet drugs, the drugs that work on the platelets like aspirin and clopidogrel just aren't very good at preventing those big clots that form in the uh, heart in atrial fibrillation. You need the stronger agents, warfarin and these new anticoagulants. Um, that's very clear now. and, and and um, uh, and uh, it's a good question, but uh, and of course we. So, so the point here is that work. if you've had a stent mm. and you're on these uh, drugs to thin your blood, you might think you're protected against stroke, but in fact you're only partially protected, Peter. Yeah, correct. And you've got to do that. We've had a text from Peter. Peter uh, says, my wife uh, was told that she's at risk of stroke because of her blood pressure and she's very worried. I don't know what to do to help her. We live two hours of town. Is there support? Linda? Yeah, look, there's certainly lots of support, um, lots of support through the community nursing um, programs that are out there and through your medical centres and just working with your local How do you people. find the support? Um, there are lots of, um, through the Stroke Foundation and lots of other um, websites that are available to provide um, really good information that is reliable and just working with your GP is the, really, is, is the key to getting that blood pressure under control. Quite often we think that blood pressure is quite benign <coughs> because we don't, we're not symptomatic with it. We don't feel our blood pressure rising, so we don't think that it's worth treating. So just working with it, getting it under control and monitoring it is really the key. 
Keep those questions and comments coming in, 1-800-817-268 or questions at rhef.com.au or text us on the number that uh, comes up on your screen. One more question before we go to our last case study. Uh, Peter, you, you know, one of the causes of stroke is when you have a blockage in the carotid artery, just Correct. about here. Yes. And the, and the rubbish breaks, not, doesn't come from your heart, it breaks off from here and goes to your brain. Well, either that or the actual artery blocks over. Um, I remember seeing one lady who came in who temporarily lost vision in one eye uh, and that we attributed and found it was due to a blockage in the artery and that evening she had the operation to remove the, the uh, blocking material from inside the artery. It's the same as a drain at home. If you're in the garden and your drain after a while blocks up and you take it apart and you find it's full of sludge and it's all rusted without being too silly, the inside of the carotid artery looks just like that and when it gets to 90% blocked, so there's only 10%, a little hole in the middle, that's when you're really at risk of having a stroke, and that can be quite devastating. But it can be fixed, and that's why we should detect it first. So, Chris, what's the evidence around, it's called carotid endarterectomy, is the operation. Um, what, what's the evidence around this, um, you know, if the doctor hears a murmur in your neck or... Uh, a noise in your neck or you get and should everybody have an ultrasound of the neck who's had a transient ischemia attack or a stroke um, so that consumers know the right question to ask their doctor? Yeah, look, the, the evidence for the benefits of carotid surgery, carotid endarterectomy uh, in people who've had a minor stroke or TIA is incredibly solid. It's It's probably the most researched operation in surgical science and there's there's huge amount of supportive data to say that surgery in that situation that Peter mentioned where the artery is quite severely narrowed um, so, uh, more than 70 percent it tends to be the threshold that we take to in, to move to surgery it will prevent many more strokes than will aspirin and cholesterol lowering drugs so surgery really is the treatment of choice so my question severe so my question disease. to you is, um, I'll come to you, Peter, and then I'll go to Chris, is you've said everybody should have an ECG. Yes. You're getting on in life, um, you know, you had diabetes or yeah. a few risk factors, you should have an ECG to say you've got atrial fibrillation and that could save your life. Yeah. If you're at risk of coronary heart disease, who should have, even if you haven't had a transient ischemic attack, who should have an ultrasound of the arteries in their neck? I think you would... <clears throat> It would be easier to say everyone, but that would not be a correct answer in a sensible world. We As an in. Australian taxpayer, I thank it, you for thank that you. answer. It comes down to identifying the risk. If a patient has other signs of comorbidities, diabetes, has a history of raised lipids, particularly good clinical examination will quite often you'll hear a murmur, but you won't hear it if you don't think to listen. And unfortunately, without being unkind, in the to and fro of life, not every patient is evaluated carefully and I think it should be part of everyone who's 65 or over should see their doctor on a regular basis whenever that is once a year and, point to the neck. and say I've been told that you need to check to see if I have that problem. But not everybody with a severe blockage will have a brewery, will have a noise. No, they won't. So, so then it's down to the people who've had a minor stroke that every, correct. every one of them should have it done. And you should say to the patient, look, um, if you ever have signs that we've been discussing of a TIA, you need to let me know straight away because we need to look into that. Um, if a person has high lipids and has um, other vascular disease, you may well decide to do the ultrasound anyway. What do you think, Chris? Look, I, I agree. I think that anyone who's had a, a stroke or mini stroke TIA um, should have their carotid arteries checked. Um, you could argue that there are some regions of the brain where the carotid artery may not be relevant to their a stroke and that's the finesse of assessing them clinically but rule of thumb is it's a very uh, reasonable test to do in someone who's had a TIA or a stroke. In people that have had no symptoms of brain ischemia then there isn't a role for screening um, with ultrasound. It, it really isn't going to be a cost effective option. Um, uh, apart from in certain situations where these are the, the, the exceptions. If you have a particularly young person who you do detect a brewery on, someone who's in their 50s or 60s, um, which, is, uh, which is young now by my standards, uh, then you... Uh, Gets younger you all the time, Christopher. <laughs> you can make a case then for a benefit for surgery, but 
surgery really only has a benefit in people who are at higher risk. Thanks very much, Chris. Let's go to our last case study. John's a 58-year-old farmer and he's at home and he complains to his wife that his face is going a bit numb and she notices that his speech is beginning to slur and he's certainly complaining of feeling dizzy. What should his wife do, Anne? I would suggest that she um, probably get an ambulance and go to hospital if he's in a remote area. Um, sometimes aspirin can help, depending on the location, but I would probably suggest she took an ambulance. She gave him an aspirin. That's if he's in a remote location. Yep. She shouldn't turn up in your surgery, should she? No. no um, she needs to go to hospital. I, I agree entirely with that. I think she, um, this patient should go to a hospital quickly. Um, it is a, a medical emergency, the same as a heart attack. A heart attack, people um, obviously have different uh, aspects and symptoms, but in the past, people haven't always looked upon a stroke that urgently. They said, oh, well, it'll come, it'll go and there's nothing can be done, and all the last two statements are completely wrong, it won't necessarily come and go, and there are things that can be done. So, I mean, the average wait when you've got hot chest pain, I'm told, is about 45 minutes, Linda. I assume it's longer when you've got symptoms like this, and it shouldn't be. Many people go to bed with symptoms of a stroke yeah. and wait till the morning. Will it go away? Won't it go away? And we, we know that time is the critical key factor. We need to get patients in there. So she needs to get into hospital ASAP. Mm. What happens there, Peter? I think she needs a good clinical examination, or he well, does, in order to determine husband, yeah. what's occurring. Uh, there are certain blood tests you would do, ECG, as we mentioned. Uh, we may do other checks to be sure there's nothing else going on medically. Um, and those tests can now be done with point-of-care testing quite quickly. So there's two situations that occur in rural Australia. One is you arrive at a small country hospital where there's no CAT scan. Right. And the reason for the CAT scan being significant is this issue about clot busting. You want to know whether it's a haemorrhage or a yes. clot and the CAT scan will tell you that. So there's no CAT scan at the hospital. What do you do next? There's basically only, there's only three things you can do when you look at a person who's got what seems to be a developing stroke. You can either do nothing, which is commonly what happens in a community. You can recognise it medically and try to organise that person to be transported quickly within a three, four hour time frame to an area that can do the clot busting, for want of a better word. Or, if that's not possible, and for many parts of rural Australia it's not, you may decide aspirin given is the only effective treatment and if the blood pressure is significantly high, gentle lowering of that blood pressure appropriately would also be considered. Chris, how... Um safe is it to make the recommendation that you should give aspirin before you jump in the ambulance? Because I suppose that depends on where you're going in the ambulance. Generally it's not recommended um, because in Australia uh, generally we do have pretty good access to imaging so we can rule out the haemorrhage stroke usually within the first few hours or so of the person um, developing symptoms. Um, so we don't recommend it. However, we, we've got evidence that, it, that if it is a hemorrhagic stroke, it probably won't do the person any harm. And, it, and the chances are that, it, as I said earlier, it's going to be an 85% chance it's a, it's a blood clot stroke. But that's the exception. Um, the, the rule is, is, as Peter said, clinical assessment, urgent CT scanning or advanced imaging if you have access to it, um, and then uh, with, a, with, a, with a look at the time frame, consider whether the patient is suitable for thrombolysis if you're a centre that can administer that treatment. The other option, um, of course, is, is, um, is uh, telemedicine and support for a hospital where there aren't stroke physician um, input on site. And, um, and, and you, that's what you, I don't want to go into detail because we're running out of time, but that's what you do. You, you give clot busting in Berry yes, we're starting, with the advice of a neurologist in Adelaide. Correct. That's the process which is mimicked around Australia. You need a dedicated team to do it, and I don't do the physical work myself, but just behind the scenes. You need a CT scanning facility. You need someone who can report on it and a neurologist at a distance and someone who can deliver the thrombolytic agent locally. And Chris, just very briefly, because again, we are running out of time, what, what's the evidence if you are able within that four and a half hour period to get clot busting if you're eligible for it and not everybody is eligible for it yeah. how much benefit do you get from that clot busting because there's been a very large trial of 50,000 people study of 50,000 people in the United States just published in the last week or two 
Hmm. Look, it's it's um it's one of our most powerful treatments in medicine. I mean, it, if if you treat early and if you treat within the first one to two hours, every one in three patients you treat will have a complete cure. We'll we'll go from paralysed to walking and out of hospital within a couple of days. The benefit starts to drop as you get out towards that four hour mark. So you get out to a number needed to treat in order to get a cure of, of over 10. But if you treat very early, your number needed to treat in order to get a cure is, is only three or four. So it's an incredibly effective treatment. Um, but it has this, this time frame limitation and that's, that's why access can be difficult. And that's one reason why you avoid aspirin, because you don't want the risk of hemorrhage. And what's the risk of hemorrhage with um, the clot busting? Again, very briefly, because we're running out of time. The risk of, hem- the risk of serious hemorrhage is about 1 in 50. Um, and you weigh that up against the chance of major benefit, as I said, which varies between 1 in 3 and 1 in 10. So there's clear net benefit. Um, but there are, there are risks, and that's why it needs to be given by, by experts in an expert care setting. No, we're, we're running out of time. Uh, so that, the message from all that is, um, you've got the, you know, the fast, if you're scoring on the fast and you look as if you're developing a stroke, you get to um, the hospital ASAP. You don't sit and wonder about it. And if you get there in the first two or three hours, you, are in, you, you stand a good chance of being in good strip. Uh, the resor- there are resources available for you from all sorts of places. There's the Stroke Foundation, there's fightstroke.com.au, there's estroke.com.au, there's the Stroke Line, there's the heartfoundation.org.au. And if you go to the Rural Health Education Foundation's website, you'll find all these links and, uh, to find more information. But that's not where you go where you're scoring on fast and you think you're having a stroke. You go to your emergency department. Peter, what are your, what are your, what's your take-home message for people? Um, <clears throat> I function as a GP, and for me, I would, like all my patients of a reasonable age group, say 65 and over, to specifically see their doctor at least once a year to say, what is my risk of stroke, and look into it appropriately, and that would help to pick up and prevent a lot of strokes down the track. Linda. The risk factors for stroke are the same for many of our other chronic illnesses, and as nursing... Um, as a nursing profession, we need to use the time that we've got with patients to assist them. Geraldine? As a pharmacist, uh, my time with patients, I can encourage them to know their numbers, know their blood pressure, know their blood sugar level, their cholesterol. Know their cholesterol levels, their lipids. And get them all down. And your exercise, up. <laughs> and? Um, in the rural and remote setting, I would say um, get to hospital fast. We need to get you somewhere quickly. And Christopher? Following on from Anne, strokes a medical emergency. Act fast, recognise the features, face, arm, speech, dial triple O, get him as quick as you can. Look, thank you all very much. It's been a great program and I hope you've enjoyed this program on beating stroke and found it informative and useful. If you're interested in obtaining more information, you can go or would like to watch the program again. I'm sure you'd love to watch the program again. Show it to your kids. Please visit the Rural Health Education Foundation's website. That's rhef.com.au and you click on the program page which is called Beat Stroke, Keep the Pressure Down. If you're a health professional, don't forget to complete your CPD, that's Continuing Professional Development Evaluation Form, which can be completed online, and you'll receive a certificate of attendance and, if eligible, CPD points. Our thanks to the Department of Health and Ageing for making this program possible, but a special thanks to you for taking time to watch and contribute to our discussion today. Now, we'd like your feedback on the program. Your comments are important to us whether they're good, bad or ugly. So let us know you watch the programme by sending us an email or a text and share your views. We really do want to hear them. I'm Norman Swan. Bye for now, but join us again soon on the Rural Health Channel.